Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Left Lens. This is a very special live stream today. We have a very special guest here tonight. Um, I hope you all are doing well. As you're coming in, make sure that you're liking the video, sharing it so people see this interview. The first half of the program is going to be a 30-minute about long interview with Nixie Lamb, who I'm going to introduce right now. So like the video, make sure you're sharing it, make sure you're subscribing to this channel, and be sure to subscribe at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong in order to support this work. All right, so this is something I wanted to do for a while, uh, get someone who really understands the politics of Hong Kong well uh, from the inside, so to speak, uh, to understand, I think, what has been a very difficult issue here in the West, especially here in the United States, especially since 2019, when there was the unrest that really did uh, impact things in Hong Kong and China more broadly. And uh, there was a lot of propaganda, a lot of misconceptions spread uh, by the United States and the West and their media and their governments. And so I think it's time to set the record straight. And I wanted to do that uh, with someone who knows the politics well. And I am so glad to introduce Nixie Lam, who is a former district council member. And now she is a member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. And I'm going to introduce her now and add her here. Hi, Nixie. How are you Hello. doing this, in this morning? This morning for you, this <laughs> evening for me. How are you doing this yes, morning? Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's good to have you here um, because uh, it, ever since 2019, Hong Kong has been in the United States and the Western media uh, just constantly being talked about, I would say, in a very misconceiving way, in a way that I think promotes uh, American and Western interests. And uh, in 2019, there was unrest. I believe it started early in the summer and it lasted for several months. There was violence. I know you've talked about your uh, personal experience with this. Many of the groups uh, that were organizing the unrest uh, were found to be uh, backed, mm -hmm. supported by governments mm -hmm. like mine, the United States, among others. And... Uh, since then, though, a lot has changed. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about is what's changed in Hong Kong. And I want to start with the national security law. And I want to start there because in June, I think it was June in 2020 when the, the law was uh, mm -hmm. enacted. Western media, uh, even today, <laughs> even in 2022, yeah, talk about today, it. Like yes. it's, it's the <laughs> end of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's freedoms are gone. Beijing has come in, and I know you've been criticized as a so-called, you know, pro-Beijing uh, member of the Legislative Council and of the political world in Hong Kong. Could you talk about what the national security law is for those who don't know what it is, and then what was the impact of it, and, and what and why, like why national security law, and what was the impact? Right, I think uh, just just put it short. Uh, the situation in two thousand nineteen is just unsafe for everyone. Um, I remember I went to the United Nations to talk about the situation in Hong Kong in, uh, in early 2020, in March. Um, basically, a lot of people doesn't really understand the situation in 2019. It's like we basically are totally unsafe as a Hong Kong normal citizens to head out to the town. Basically, you, you receive WhatsApp calendars on where the mobs will go around which town, which part of the town, and then you just need to avoid the area. Basically, they are organizing a lot of violent movements around. They're throwing petrol bombs basically every day on a daily basis. So, I mean, for everyone to call in a city like Hong Kong in 2019, a beautiful site to behold, which Nancy Pelosi called us, it's ridiculous. Um, during that time, uh, just normal, the people in Hong Kong are basically hopeless. When you talk about freedom, when a lot of the Western media calling us loss of freedom after the NSL is basically a joke for Hong Kong people. Because we see no hope in Hong Kong anymore in 2019 for about a year time. 
we just don't know how to end the whole violence things. They were everywhere. They were in every part of town. And if you see someone doing some crazy stuff, normally, you know, nowadays people hold up their phones and take a picture. You will get bashed up immediately because they don't want you to have any any um, uh, evidence of them bashing up the towns and stuff like that. So it, it's just in a very bad situation. So NSL, national security law, basically put a big pause on all that. Um, basically, it's a solution to end all those violence movements during that time. So a lot of people really need to understand the real situation, what's been happening in 2019. Um, I know uh, a lot of people, if you read enough what has been happening in Hong Kong during that time, we have a anti-extradition bill movements. A lot of people just didn't like it. And then, but they used that opportunity to do a lot of propaganda and promotions and motivate people to go out, take out to the street. Take out to the street is okay. I mean, in Hong Kong, we always are not really happy about the situation. We go out the street, complain about the government and things like that. It's totally fine in Hong Kong. But they're using violence movements in Hong Kong around every area. Since 2019, around end of June, they've been doing things like um, mopping around, just, just wrapping around the headquarters of the police of Hong Kong, Hong Kong police, which is very symbolic, just showing that what well, we can do whatever to take down the government. And then the second thing they do is on the, the, the Hanover Day, which is the 1st of July, they, they, they start attacking the Legislative Council buildings. So they're trashing all the glasses walls and things like that. And then they went into the chamber and then calling them freedom fighters. I mean, I've been doing a lot of overseas interviews with BBC or CNN and things like that. I've been doing those interviews on a daily basis because they have different shows and radios and TVs and stuff like that. I was just telling them, I mean, if you think using such violence to normal citizens or anyone that you don't like or have a different political views, this is not a normal city situation. I mean, you can't, any city would not accept that sort of extends abuse of violence. And then, but at, during that time, all those Western media were calling them, oh, this, these are freedom fighters. We should embrace them. We should embrace them, bashing up people with different views. I mean, they were, I mean, uh, you you see footage of videos that are still online these days that people were just very angry of what they're doing. They're basically saying that I support the, the Chinese government. This is, I'm Chinese people. And then they just go and bash them up, shed with blood, and then even took off their pants in the streets, on live. And they think the humiliation would scare them off. But a lot of people still stand really firm. So for national security law to enact during that time is very important. Basically, to put a big pause to say, if you do things like that anymore, we're going to stop you guys. It's basically the national security law is not a proper or rounded yet. It's just to pause that situation. So the national security at that time, uh, we are actually only talking about so um, um, so, so seditions, right? So, so part of seditions, uh, how you connect with over foreign powers or use of terrorism. So things like that. It's not like a rounded national security law like all the Western countries they have. If you look at the little clause and terms and things like that, within their law is much serious if you do that comparison. Then I just don't really understand how they could continually open their eye and lie about their own law and then say, well, Hong Kong doesn't have freedom anymore. I mean, if you look at the situation in Hong Kong right now, we, we, we finally can freely walk around the streets and things like that. I share one of my views uh, during the um, United Nations uh, Human Rights Council speech. It's about during that time, it's really sad that if you are in a coffee shop, if you want to chat up to your friends, normally you just like, you feel unhappy about something, you just share whatever you like, right? It doesn't really matter who sits around you. But during that time in Hong Kong, it's impossible. If you sit in a restaurant, and you say, well, I'm not really happy about what they've been doing. Use of violence is not okay. Your photo will be taken by someone that have a different view with you. They took a picture of you. They will search your personal information. They will search your family's information. And then they will take all the information online on Telegram. And then people attack you. People they say, well, we will get them after work. And there was a lady that really get attacked after work. She got bashed up only because she went to one of the government sessions sharing her views that is different with them. They say, well, use of violence is not okay. Can we find a solution? I mean, that's a quite a fair, like very, very soft approach. But and then they, they're still not happy about it. 
they still decided to bashing her up is the best solution to everything. They also been burning down like like HSBC, the you know the iconic lions that we have in front of the HSBC. They've been throwing petrol bombs to like MTR stations, train stations, right. and they've been doing a lot of all those like tra train track. You know, a lot of people need to go to work in the morning. I mean, I don't know why is it so freedom fighter ish to stop everyone by going to work. I mean, what's the purpose by only creating all those chaos? So, I mean, people basically went into this crazy moments that they think they're doing the right thing. We can just bash up the whole city and then we can burn the whole thing up and then we will become a phoenix or anything and then we will reborn. But it is not true. I mean, a lot of people sort of like, I, I know a lot of the younger, um, younger protesters, they sort of believe that that is something right. So I feel pretty sad for them. They get used by those like people that really know their purposes really know what they're doing. A lot of them flee to the overseas and a lot of them are forming so-called so-and-so council, so-and-so council, a Hong Kong watch or whatever. I mean, they're just the puppets from another foreign force to, to do that. It's just like a, like a copy and paste model for Xinjiang matter, for, for Tibet matters, and now it's Hong Kong matter. Well, now it's like more updated, it's the Taiwan matters, whatever. So, I mean, it's just been really sad that a lot of youngsters got used by them. And uh, the national security law, I really encourage everyone, if you're concerned about the situation, and read about the, the national security law that we had in 2020. Um, it's basically very mild, <laughs> seriously very mild. So we are still all, always, I mean, for as a legislator, we are also looking into how we can make it better because um, from the beginning, because of the basic law uh, requirement, we need to have an article 23. Uh, it's, it's more comprehensive. So we, we will have to look into that as well. I think basically optimistically within this term. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. National the national security law definitely felt like I mean Article twenty three in the basic law was never really enforced. It's the article yes. about secessionism and, and terrorism yes. and kind of yes. um, trying to promote uh, a breakaway. And the the forces that were committing all of this violence, as I said earlier in the program, that there was a lot of backing from my government. I, I want to call it my or mm. the United States <laughs> government. Um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have much control about what my government does. But um, yes, there was a lot of funding coming into these organizations committing this violence. And uh, this has led Beijing, I mean, this has led the, 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 the Chinese government to call what happened in Hong Kong a color revolution attempt. I mean, what have you thought? Is that how, from your experience, like how has this been talked about? And now there's been a lot of political changes that have happened since the implementation of the national security law. Could you talk about that as well? Maybe first talk about this color revolution uh, narrative that uh, people, you know, I think a lot of people in the West would say, well, what's that? And why would we call what happened in Hong Kong that? And then if you could talk about the political changes that have happened since in response. Right. I think for, for the color revolutions, like before all that happens in Hong Kong, we never thought about it. I mean, Hong Kong's been always a very peaceful freedom, whatever you do, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of town. So, but if you look at uh, later on, a lot of Hong Kong people actually read online and then read on this, uh, like the, what, what is color, color revolution? Basically, as I mentioned earlier, why would I mention first they attacked the police headquarters? For any color revolution they export in any other city, they first attacked the police force. They want to tackle down to make, sorry, my cat was running around. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so basically you have to, you, you, if you look at the characteristics for, for color revolution, they first need to um, degrade your, your police force, making them like evil. So uh, there's a lot of fabricated stories, as I mentioned, starting from June, they were saying, oh, the police is useless. And then later on, when they attacked the, um, the legislative council building, they started to say, well, police is using um, un unwanted forces, and then they are unlawful, they're trying to, and then, and then later on, it's sort of established into Policemen were raping people around town. They're killing a lot of people. The body were unfound, and people go to like that's a that's a Thai uh, that does that Prince Edward MTR station. Um, <laughs> sort of I call it drama. A lot of people are lying about one of the one of the uh, the, the unsuccessful um 
uh, taking over of the station a a killing field where the police killed a lot of people and then they sort of like all the bodies were disappeared so they make this myth and a lot of people sort of believe it because uh, as i mentioned a lot of hong kong people are not very familiar with the political thing we are quite naive in that terms and they believe in the story and then a lot of people think well why why would the police like killing all those people and hiding the bodies um, in that sense. So it's still, still up in, I mean, up to today, a lot of people still believe in that sort of story. So there's a lot of fabricated stories just basically to make people hate your own government, hate your own administration, and then trying to find the resolution and they're telling, they're having like banners and things like, please, the, the US troops, please come over and take over Hong Kong. Um, 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 like President Trump, please come and help us. So things like that. And as I mentioned earlier, also Nancy Pelosi mentioned about uh, the Hong Kong scene where all the burning around town is a beautiful sight to behold. That's why the Chinese, all the Chinese people around the globe were really angry about the sentence, seriously. If you are looking at your own town burning like that, it's basically like, like a crazy town, like burning everywhere, petrol bombs is a norm, things like that. And they're calling it a beautiful sight to be, behold. I think it's just like, she's just, an evil person you're not even normal you know so so things like that i mean i mean it, it's just I've, i haven't been talking about this for quite some time and i can't still hold my anger towards yeah. all this and um <laughs> i don't I mean, blame it, you i don't blame you but yeah. especially, especially about what's been because happening recently. i know i know a lot of the elderly people because they are not very happy about the situation they didn't even take over the street and took a fight with them. I know this older man, my, my friend's neighbor, she, he's living on like um upstairs of her. And you know, they, they take take over all the streets and stuff and putting all the bricks on the road. So make sure no cars can pass through. So they're making all those roadblocks. This old man, like, I think he's about 70. He just went down trying to pick up the bricks to so just trying to clean out a road because a lot of people, it's the pathway to another hospital, you know? You just can't block things like that. You never know who's going to be in a very big danger that they need to go to hospital. And they just bash him up. His head was bloodshedded. And then my friend went home and said, what was wrong with your head? And he said, I was just trying to pick up some brakes on the floor. <laughs> I mean, that's been happening in everywhere. And they, we don't, like those people don't even dare to go to the police station because there's no help at that time. We don't have enough like manpower. And yeah. I mean, they don't want them personal information to expose. That's why they don't even want to report the, the, the incidents. So that's why I said national security control is very important at that time to pick everything on, on, a, on a big pause. First of all, a lot of people, because they don't really understand the law, they will try to put, put they, they take back a bit, you know? I remember um, before the enactment that night, like maybe before 12 o'clock at midnight, they were saying let's do like the last bit of crazy thing and then they're tackling the yun long town again like to say they're saying well this is like right before the national security law because it is you can't trace back on the records and things like that so let's do something before that i mean th that's how crazy they are they just based and then they're saying well it's only motivated by the people, so nobody organized it and things like that. How could you believe that? I mean, all those prop propaganda online, all those linkage with the Western media and politicians. I mean, I, I encourage people, if you are interested in this situation, uh, in the situation during that time, you can go to the, the Chinese Foreign Ministry website. They have a very long track record in that two years on what's been happening in Hong Kong and then which politician in the U.S. says something and then they have, the, they have this like cooperation map, right? Timeline. So you can look at what's been happening. It's very important. I actually also make a clip earlier in the, on, on YouTube on, on that so people know how what, what they do first and then they basically were laying some of the evidence to make sure that it makes sense and then the Western media and politicians will come to say yeah because they did that so let's do something let's sanction them and things like that and and very important when you mentioned about the election reform during that time why is it necessary um i think the chinese government's been giving way too much freedom <laughs> to i mean they, the, the opposition has been doing whatever they want and they're even like they can do basically propose anything that's totally fine 
what happened is in 2019, uh, during the election, they were proposing once they enter into the government, sorry, my testing. <laughs> yeah. So once they enter the government, they will object every single motions and bills and things like that. So they were basically looking to paralyze the whole government to take over and everything. And, and plus also because the use of violence, a lot of people are scared to even go to the polling station because if they got identified, they will get bashed up and things like that. Uh, I, we know some of the people are motivating um, the youngster to hide away their parents' Hong Kong ID card because that's the ID card that you can go in and vote. And then they they encourage him to them to do that, and and that is even like unlawful in Hong Kong of uh, election law and things like that. So they've been doing a lot of that that kind of things. Um, I can't put too much information because the interview is quite short, but a lot of things that they were do, they were doing like that. So I think for the foundation for having Hong Kong special administration region, it's basically is Hong Kong administering Hong Kong and um. Paycheck, paycheck administrating Hong Kong. So, I mean, a lot of people are arguing that. I've been doing a lot of interviews to say, well, you're pro Beijing, and uh, why why do we need Patriot running Hong Kong? I mean, I asked them the question, if you are in the States, and if a person to say, my sole reason for entering into the parliament or whatever is to paralyze your government and take over everything and uh, trying to destroy and then trying to ask all the politicians to ask another foreign country to sanction your own country. I don't think that's going to work. I mean, you will be sued by sedition or any other like, like sort of like forms of like you're selling your own countries. Right. But why is it okay in Hong Kong? Is it only because you are the poetry person that was funding the whole movement? And, and, I mean, it's just very cliche that they, they've been doing a lot of that. And then, it, they, they were doing all, all the like they're just trying to motivate normal Hong Kong citizens to hate the city, hate the country, hate all the system, and trying to destroy the thing. They say, "Well, let let us take over. We can be the big boss of Hong Kong, and then we can motivate everything." So that is totally not okay um, for for any 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 uh, any government. So basically, um, they revamped the election um, reforms um, uh, later on to uh, make sure that people were um uh, pe people can uh, like like th those people are not going into to destroy the hong kong home administration and things like that so um yeah so basically like that <laughs> well yeah well uh thanks for the overview of these political changes uh, and now you know now that you mentioned nancy pelosi you know, I wanted to ask your reaction about what's been going on because the the connection between what has been happening in Hong Kong and U.S. interference in Hong Kong is very connected to what's happening with Taiwan. Uh, I yeah. mean, a lot of these uh, so-called uh, secessionists, like opposition, right, color revolutionists, so to speak, uh, they went they went to Taiwan after um, after uh, the unrest was uh, dissipated and. Nancy Pelosi herself in 2019 in the lead up to the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which uh, uh, really got the ball rolling in terms of the United States government literally try, uh, attempting to impose sanctions and enforce other yeah. sanctions on Hong Kong, sanctions on Iran and in other yeah. countries yeah. Um, on Hong Kong. Uh, she, invite, she was part of uh, the uh, congressional... A leadership which invited people like Joshua Wong and Nathan Law to Congress to lobby so they could lobby for this legislation. Could you could you tell me what, what is your reaction to all that's going on right now? It, and what's the connection with Hong Kong? Because uh, as you know, as all our viewers know, uh, Nancy Pelosi just uh, completed this provocative trip uh, to Taiwan, which has angered China, <laughs> rightfully so and uh, has really escalated tensions. Uh, so uh, what's your reaction to all of this? And what's the relationship to Hong Kong? Because it's not, it seems like there's a connection here. Well, basically, one country and two system, this, this special system, a lot of people say, well, that is, this is to try to prepare uh, whether we can apply that to Taiwan as well. Because, because of the historical reason, um, even we are still looking for unifying uh, China as a whole. So Taiwan is part of it. Um, in 2019, 
the biggest winner over the whole movement is Chai Ying Wen. She is she's she's almost losing her battle during that time. But and then what's been happening in Hong Kong? They're using the scare tactics and this and that, trying to make people scared about the mainland Chinese government and things like that. So that's why a lot of people said, well, why don't we just vote for the green side? So it's which is the Chinese one, uh, uh, Min Jingdang side. So a lot of people doesn't really understand the situation because first of all, I, I realized a lot of the foreign viewers doesn't really understand what is one country, two system. Um, what are the rights uh, of the mainland Chinese government? Um, because we have, we are one, one country, two system runs under one country first, okay? So we're still one, under one country. So when I write on, when I'm traveling on, on a piece of like immigration paper, I write Hong Kong as they are, comma, China. So that is my national. You can't call Hong Kong an independent state because we have a one country, because we have a two system. Um, a lot of people trying to ignore that. I mean, um, seasoned politicians in the Western world, they're trying to ignore that situation to say, well, Hong Kong is very independent. We are independently, we can do in independently on business or businesses or say like Olympics and things like that because of the one country, two system law. So please look at the basic law, what we are granted the rights and things like that. We are granted the right to use Hong Kong SAR to go out and do our business forums and communications and things like that. But doesn't mean that we are another separate country. So that is very, that is very quite difficult sometimes for me to try to explain to a lot of people because they, they don't really understand we have a basic law. They don't really understand the negotiations in between um, um, the UK government and the, and the Chinese government and things like that. So um, that's why you see a lot of the overseas politicians are still using, especially the UK ones, still, still saying, um, China bleached the, the, our promises uh, when we do the handover. But seriously, if you look at the basic law, it's, it is only an agreement paper that all the clauses that Chinese government sort of like say, okay, were already enacted within the basic law. So all has been already done. That's why a lot of the local Chinese government officials, including those who are, those local government officials in Hong Kong, were saying the, 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 the Sino-British Hong Kong, the British Hong Kong like agreement British China agreement is an overdated document because all the information and all the things were basically put down into the basic law. That's why we're running the, the basic law um, in Hong Kong. So um, I think um, it's very sad sometimes because Hong Kong is only a very small city around the world. Uh, we have a very different system. You can't, I think often quite a lot of um, um, reporters that I get in touch with trying to use their their um, standard or their country standards or their country's election rules to say why you Hong Kong you're using this. I remember about what three months ago, actually, yeah, about three months ago, uh, I was actually in an interview with a European, I think it's a Danish TV station or whatever, they came to Hong Kong. Um, I was having an interview with them. Um, well, they were asking me why is it um, illegal for a um, like like a primary elections, right? Like a primary elections, because a lot of our politicians were, were arrested because of that. I told them, well, if you look at the election laws in Hong Kong, this is very clearly because it's a very different set of law. I mean, I've been running for two terms for as a district councillor, as a legislator now, I know very well on all those election laws. In Hong Kong, we are looking for very fair elections. So it's very different to say in the US, where well, you can raise more money, right? You can do speeches and things like that. You can raise more money so you can spend more money on promotions and things like that. But it's not like that in Hong Kong. Everybody have a top bar of how much you can spend on your elections. Every single spending, you have to clearly record with receipt and things like that we need to submit within 24 hours within that election period. So everyone are running on the same budgets, trying to make the election fair. No one, it says very clear on the law that no one can encourage or discourage anyone to run or not run an election, right? Mm. So if you're running a primary, if you look at the law, if you run a primary, that is what, illegal. 
And at that time, when they tried to run a primary, we had numbers of very senior government official, including a lot of the a lot of the um the Hong Kong like famous like like heavyweight politicians, and they know the basic law very well and things like that. To say, well, that is not right. You need to stop. They got warnings. It's not that something made up. Okay, they have a series of warnings. If you look at back at, at the news and things like that, I, I'm sure there's a lot of English news that is available online for searching. If you look at that, they have done a lot of warning to say, "Well, this is not okay. You would get arrested because that 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 is illegal." They didn't stop. When they get arrested, those just uh, pro democracy <laughs> leaders they say, "Oh, we didn't know they would be so serious this time." I mean, <laughs> it's it's basically a joke. I mean, so so if you are in Hong Kong in long enough, if you read enough information, it's basically like a joke. I mean, you can't be the bad kid all the time. You can't think that I can do whatever I want. My parents or my mom's gonna not not gonna bash me up or whatever, right? So <laughs> I think they just sort of having that momentum because they've been doing a lot of crazy things, and they think, "Oh, Chinese government is okay. They can let us do this." Like same for the movement in two thousand nineteen. Before that, it was okay. I mean, they didn't they, they just take out the streets and things like that, and then they sort of like taste the blood and things well that is okay we can do some crazy stuff and nobody's going to stop us mm. they burn the chinese national flag for about seven times if i remember around seven times like step on the flag burning and doing some really childish stuff because it's i mean a lot of them are really young and holding and, holding and, american flags and donald yeah Trump whatever waving. Yeah. Oh, that guy's really famous he got kicked down by one of the pedestrian ones and well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy, this, this uncle got really angry. Said, well, why are you doing that? Like, we're Chinese people. But anyway, so they've been doing all that, just trying to make a lot of people to with them or or trying to scare a lot of people to just mute themselves. It doesn't mean that a lot of people are supporting them. I've been, As I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of Western media in, in interviews and stuff like that. I remember one time, I was really angry at that time when he asked me that question. Um, I, was, I think I was doing the BBC radio uh, interview when they start using violence on the streets. Um, I think that's like end of, uh, I think it's like 30th of June or something like that, quite, quite precisely. And he asked me, well, oh, now the, the mobs are using, I mean, now the protesters, not the mobs, now the protesters are using violence on, on the streets. So are you happy? Because now you guys can blame on the violence instead. And I was like, I got really pissed off. And I say to him, right, Hello, I'm Hong Kong people. Why would I be happy to see we are bashing up ourselves, like Hong Kong people attacking Hong Kong people and doing all that and hating our, our own nations and things like that? Why would I be happy? I mean, what sort of things are going on with their mind can make them ask me that questions, you know? It's just very disgusting sometimes. It's just really sad. And every time when they interview um, they keep on, you know, it's it's quite sad sometimes. I remember that was one time I was doing an interview with Al Jazeera. I got really pissed off because the organizer were lying when they're doing overseas interview. They're lying that they were the weakers. They're lying that they got bashed up, they got killed, they got raped or whatever. They were the one that were using violence on the streets to everyone, every single person, no matter they were 80s or their child. They're attacking policemen children said they're only five years old so they were having their name list and everything go into the kindergarten telling people this kindergarten this kid is a policeman's children and then they'll go and attack them even those uh, i'm just really sad even those teachers that was working in the kindergarten because their political views is different they decided okay because you're a policeman's teacher that the son i will attack you i'll attack her it doesn't really matter they're three years old five years or whatever so it, it was to, to that extent. That's why I was so angry. I think having a different political views is totally fine. It doesn't really matter. It's like religions, right? You, you're Christian, you're, you're Islamic, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But you don't go and attack people every day. You don't throw petrol bombs. You don't. I mean, a, a man actually passed away. A no man was actually passed away because they're throwing bricks and they hit his head. He, he passed away. Nobody mentioned about it. Every day on the Western news, they only mention how how moral are those freedom fighters because they want freedom and democracy is the highest value of life or whatever. It's even higher than people's life. It's all, even yeah. higher than people's livelihood. I mean, 
anyone, if you decided to live in a city, right, you're looking for stability. You're looking for a place that you can build your career, have a family, have a safe place to have retirement or things like that. Hong Kong was a very good place to have all that before, but not anymore in 2019, which is basically burning everywhere. For me, I, I was scared like for about a year time because I'm a politician and all my information was actually on Telegram. I don't have any private information anymore, to be honest, Until up until now. I still have crazy people sending me raw meat packages from Taiwan from last election in 2000, uh, last year end of last year for my legislative because I'm quite vocal and I'm, a, I'm quite vocal on the international platform. So the guy that flew to Taiwan decided next day is a bitch, so I'm going to send her a pack of world meat to warn her. So that, things like that. Why do, why do you think that is okay? I mean, I mean, I remember even, I remember quite a number of years ago, uh, some like like British politician was saying that because he's being a conservative um, parliament member, that's why his kids got bullied in school. Why don't he come up and talk about this is not okay in Hong Kong? No one. All the politicians were milked and saying, well, we need to support Hong Kong. Support what? By sending what? Weapons? And I mean, encouraging their linked politician to write a letter seriously you, I, I encourage everyone to search for that letter a bunch of politicians wrote a letter from the civic party wrote a letter to the to the u.s parliament to say please sanction our country but please sanction please sanction hong kong right and i remember i was doing an australian um i think i think it's abc news interviewed um, well, the interview is very biased as normally, <laughs> as normal. And he asked me, why, why, why are those guys got like disqualified? I mean, they're politician. They only sent a letter. And I said, oh, come, on, oh, come on, if you put on this, let, let's make, let's make a change of situation. Imagine if you have a bunch of parliament members in Australia send an exactly the same letter to Xi Jinping <laughs> to say, the PRC government, please come and sanction our city because we have this and that and that. What would you do to those politicians, right? Imagine that was happened in US. They write a letter to the Chinese government to say, because Nancy Pelosi this and that, why don't you sanction? I think you get arrested Im immediately, right? So I think you, you can't keep on having double standard on only because we're Chinese. Mm. Um, I think doing a lot of the speech in the Human Rights Council in 2020. Well, that, that's fr about three meetings um, or like the meeting schedules in, um, in 2020. I went to all of them, basically to share all those views. I mean, it's a normal views from a normal person. If you, if you look at things, take out all the political views or whatever, you can't use violence. I mean, that's a universal standard on using violence on people with different views. But they think it's acceptable because you are Chinese, because you're supporting their movement, and because you are supporting democracy. I remember it's quite vivid that a lot of people know that um, that animate about a um, um, a, a deaf deaf god used knocking on every country's door. That's Syria, that's like Iran, and then that's Hong Kong. And now they're updating that to Taiwan. I mean, that's quite vivid. A lot of people around other countries know what is actually happening. They can't lie anymore, especially in Hong Kong. People are much smarter now. We are quite naive politically in 2019 before that. Um, we think sometimes um, being nice, being like, you know, like we have like, we believe in Confucius, right? <laughs> being nice to people can bring harmony and bring peace. But sometimes you just really need to end it in a strong way. I mean, you have to pick a big pause to say, this is enough. I mean, or else people can't live in the city anymore because we've been giving enough time, about a year time, for them to try to take back a bit. They, they are unwilling to do any negotiations. They are trying to um, have like different requirements that is impossible to reach and that is even bleaching the basic law and things like that. So, I mean, the whole situation in Hong Kong is quite, quite sad at that time. Still, like, at this moment, when people ask me, what do you think about the situation? I feel people still need time to mend their, their, um, their mind and things like that. I'm, I'm trying to encourage a lot of people starting from this year 
to um, try to listen more to people with different views and trying to understand them because when people, I believe when people think, right, when they, after the 2019 and, and then there's like two years of pandemic situation, people will sit and still start thinking and then they will know during that time, maybe it's like all on emotion, but at, at this time, sort of they understand something's wrong. Somebody is trying to provoke this and maybe it's about time for us to help ourselves so start the conversation together trying to rebuild the city into what we were always have i mean the economy is going up in 2018 a lot of people are trying to expand their businesses but and then in 2019 because of all the social unrest we ran down and then that's pandemic we ran down so this is about time for us to rebuild everything really hmm. yeah yeah well well thank you for I mean, that that was just a really helpful uh, analysis and, and look into things in Hong Kong. Well, what I, I know we're a little bit over, but if you have time for one more question, because we went over a lot of sort of, you know, the interference, the propaganda uh, that surrounds the national security law, surrounds the political changes, surrounds the color revolution attempt, the U.S. backed attempt to create chaos in Hong Kong. Is really a big part of this, as you mentioned before, this overall campaign of kind of like pick your issue, Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong. It's all about create trying to create instability. And one of the ways you do that is propaganda. It had a big effect over uh, where I sit in terms of getting people to buy into this propaganda. But I wanted to ask because now there's a new uh, chief executive of the Legislative Council, John Lee. Now there is this expanded electoral format. Uh, the uh, Legislative Council expanded uh, by quite a lot. And, and I think you made a really good point about how Hong Kong has actually, in terms of how China has governed, it, it has been quite liberally hand. Like it, it, Hong Kong had a, has had a lot of autonomy. Sim I mean, Taiwan yeah. as well. People don't understand this in the United States. In the West, they think, oh, freedom is over. Everything is so bad. But actually, especially in these two cases, Hong Kong in particular, autonomy has been really prioritized. But with all of this unrest that happened and the interference, obviously there had to be changes. Now that there is kind of a, a, a homeostasis, so to speak, stability now, what are some of the issues that you hope and that you have been talking about with others, maybe in the legislative council, maybe just in pe with people in general that uh, uh, need to and maybe want to be tackled right now in the future, now that there isn't uh, this sort of pressing unrest, this violent unrest backed by a, a foreign power, a yeah. hegemonic power. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What's next for Hong Kong? And, and yeah, what do you think are the pressing issues moving forward? Well, first for quite some years, the mainland Chinese government has been doing a lot of plan along the southern side of China. So the Guangdong provinces, which is connected, directly connected to Hong Kong, we can basically walk over there, uh, Hong Kong to Xinjiang and things like that. Um, we have a GBA plan. We have a Greater Bay Area plan where we're trying to have different cities having their own um, uh, concentrated in industry and making like a Bay Area sort of economy um, circle. Hong Kong was always in part of it, but Hong Kong cannot find where they should situate themselves. For quite some years in the Legislative Council, every single issue that is related to connecting with the mainland Chinese government or mainland Chinese policy were um, ignored or trying to use um, uh, filibustering to turn that down and things like that. So it takes some time to reconnect all those dots together and try to smooth things out. Hong Kong cannot always isolate themselves and connect them to, I mean, a lot of the Western politicians trying to cut off all the ties with Hong Kong, uh, uh, with Hong Kong, with other uh, uh, Chinese mainland cities um, and trying to, okay, you can, because you are two system, please connect with the Western world. I mean, Hong Kong is always a hub that was connecting Hong Kong with international world and mainland with China, international world as well, because we, Ba under the basic uh, basic law, we run under common law, which is a different set of legal system, which is easier to connect with the Western uh, countries and things like that. So for Hong Kong to re-pick up, I mean, it, it, makes, it, it takes some time to pick up on how we can do a better smooth 
smooth a representative of like as a Chi Chinese international city, how we connect with the international world and how we utilize the um the Greater Bay Area situation to to do a lot of investments or or prosperities for the younger people. I mean, for younger people, I think uh, for some quite some years we cannot do a lot of long term development on education or career have developments or, or or things like that for our young youngsters. A lot of things were concentrated into economy developments or basically political arguments. Um, starting from this year, I've been proposing that we need a very holistic plan on looking in what sort of um, like career role that we need, like what sort of like uh, occupations we need in the future since because Hong Kong's been building um, building our technology, uh, building as a regional uh, technology hub and things like that. We need a lot of technical stuff. But then, then in Hong Kong, in our own education um, loop, we sort of don't have that specific education or specific academic pathway for youngsters to go through and then to fit into those um, occupations. So we need a long-term sort of strategy on planning a long way for our youngsters to have different ways of academic, uh, like a new, like sort of like subjects, um, the curriculums for them to study. And then when they graduate, they can fit into those roles that were needed in Hong Kong and also in GBA or, or, or abroad. So more updated curriculums. Um, I've been trying to encourage the government to do that, but at the moment, because it's sort of shattered in between different bureaus, it takes time to run. But for this new administrations, they sort of like trying to work as a team. So I think it's quite, it's quite interesting. We're still observing how successfully that will be done. I remember um, previously when we were trying to talk to different bureaus. I mean, for, 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 for youngsters, it's not only under the education bureau. Sometimes, like, as I mentioned earlier, if it's related to technology, maybe we need to talk to um, different departments that they know what, what we're actually projecting and things like that. So... It's, it's all about cross bureau communication and how we can smooth that out. Um, previously, when you're trying to talk to issues that talk, talk about issues that is cross bureau, um, it's always like basically like a nod. You cannot go through the communication loops and things like that. So things were stopped. But for this administration, it's very interesting. From the beginning, when John Lee ran his campaign, he kept on saying, we work as a team, we work as a team. And I remember the first time he went to the Legislative Council um, to talk about his plans and things like that. After that, all his um, um, all the all, all the bureau secretary will were in our restaurant where we have an anti anti chamber opposite of the chamber, so the week they can they have sofas and then they talk about. Right before they went out to talk to the um, the reporters, it's very interesting. You know how when we go to camps, right? When we're young, we go to camps. We 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 we, we stand on in a circle and say, "Oh, let's do this!" Yes, you know, sort of things like that. They're sort of doing something like they stand in a circle and discuss. Okay, we will do this, and you will talk about this, and then they went out, and then that bounding. It's something that only builds within what two months because the election time is about two months and so and they they decide to find people for the government of officials and I think that is very interesting. I observe that it seems like really cross bureau communication will really work this time. So that's why we are, a lot of the politicians like me were trying to encourage more um, cross bureau um, discussions and trying to push things down. I think um, basically what what there's always issues for any cities to be solved, right? But previously, a lot of the time, I think 90% of the time were waste if within the councils on fighting. So how to battle in between different political um, um, ideologies or stuff. But I think a lot of the livelihood stuff were never done. I mean, how we can find land, how we can build a better career path for our children. What about the women power, how we can release so. Uh, um, infrastructure building and how we can tackle some of the environmental issues and things like that. I mean, we're basically facing same set of issue in different forms in every single cities. We we need to solve that. We can't waste all the time on filibustering like before. Um, they can like by electing a a chairman of so and so panel could take a week <laughs> versus five minutes. <laughs> I mean, why? <laughs> They're just trying to waste all those time. And then they will say, oh, the government is not doing anything. Well, well, they can't do anything. No bills can actually pass the council yeah. at all. So so that's why I think it, it, it takes time to pick up.
but things are picking up. So I'm quite optimistic. I mean, yesterday we just announced that we will um uh, we will turn uh, lower down the bar into quarantine because Hong Kong still have obviously quarantine if you come into Hong Kong. It was seven days. It was, it was 21 days before and it was 14 days and then seven days for quite a number of time. And then yesterday it turned down to three days and four, uh, four three days in whole quarantine hotel and four days that you can move around town and things stuff like that. I think it's it's much getting that's getting much better and getting the decision are getting much more scientific based, which is very important because previously it's always about the opposition is not very happy so we need to maneuver around so why why don't we shy away and not and not do anything? But now it's more more on okay the 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 people of the city having this hope why don't why don't us get together and try to solve this issue? So, so that sort of approach. So that is the basically the changes that I can see within these two months. So hopefully things will get done, and uh, hopefully everyone can visit Hong Kong soon. <laughs> we have represented in November. That's something that I try to push. <laughs> right. Where? Right. Well, uh, Nixie, thanks so much um, for your uh, just you know, your wealth of knowledge about the situation in Hong Kong, its relationship to this larger uh, issue uh, that the U.S. is having with China (laughs) and all of the things in between. Um, I really appreciate it. For everyone who is still here, be sure to stick around. There's still half a program to go. Uh, But Miss uh, Miss Nixie Lam, we'll have to do this again sometime. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, that was a really good conversation. Um, you know, briefer than some others, but we still almost got up to an hour. Keep liking the stream, though. Keep liking the stream. Um, keep liking the video because we're gonna go for probably uh wow, it's ten thirty. Um, probably another fifteen to thirty minutes. Okay, like the video, hit the the subscription button, do all that good stuff. Thank you everyone uh for especially the moderators out there thank you big teal loa everyone else uh who is helping moderate i saw you doing a really good job i saw some really interesting ones um out in the chat but nonetheless uh, i really appreciate you all um helping out with that and yeah i want to do one more story though for all of you so of course like the video while i'm getting that together and of course, um, subscribe on Patreon, patreon.com slash Danny High Fong. It's how you support the channel. And there's other options in the description as well. Thanks to the moderators also for plugging. So that was a great conversation. And uh, I, I'm going to try to cover two things really quickly. Uh, hopefully, I, I want to get off before 11 p.m. Eastern tonight. <laughs> but there's um, something I didn't get to ask. Um, I didn't get to ask Nixie Lamb about and something I do want to cover. There's something called the uh, expat exodus happening from Hong Kong. And I, I want to read. I want to read. I kind of want to drink up some of these uh, uh, white tears. Okay. Because <laughs> I found something in my research because I was just trying to brush up on some things Hong Kong. And I remember, you know, I've been hearing, I have, a, I know quite a few expats at this point, and most of them are very, you could say pro-China, or they defend China in the final analysis. But I've noticed that with COVID-19 and the zero COVID dynamic policy that China continues to implement, and with all the tensions around Taiwan and other issues, as things have heated up, there has been more of a hesitancy among the expat community to be as firm about defending China. And I think that's because the the vast majority of people who call themselves expats uh, are, are mainly white Anglo-Saxon people from the Western world who go to these countries to make a lot of money and absolutely have no respect for where they are. That's the vast majority. That's not everybody, but that's the majority. Um, so I want to read this very f- funny really quickly, and then I want to get into Roger Waters, what he said on CNN. 
So this is really funny to me. I'm 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 gonna read this quickly. <laughs> uh, but let's let's have let's cheers to some white tears. All right. Um, so here is South China Morning Post today. Farewell, Hong Kong. You are part of who I am. After 28 years, it was time to leave Hong Kong and return to the UK. And the reasons will be familiar to many who have joined the quote unquote expat exodus. Cliff Buttle. There's Cliff right there. Uh, so he is not smiling anymore. He is he is uh, weeping over his lost uh, Hong Kong. So here he is saying he's it's a late summer's day in 94. He left London behind and boarded a plane to Hong Kong. Never would have guessed my this first visit to the city would last 28 years. It's been the trip of a lifetime. Last week, I took a one-way flight the opposite direction. I returned to England for the first time since the pandemic began, and I intend to stay. It's time for a change of scene. Leaving was hard and sad. My reasons will be familiar to many who have joined the expat exodus, quote-unquote. Hong Kong's travel curbs hit those with family overseas hard. My younger son is studying in the UK, and I've hardly seen him for three years. I have not seen my parents at all. The tough COVID-19 measures have lasted too long. They have sucked much of the joy out of everyday life and left the city isolated. Okay, so starting off with COVID is a low-hanging fruit because of the way that a lot of, uh, especially uh, white Americans, white Westerners have treated COVID-19, a lot of discontent around it. So there's been a lot of discontent around COVID-19 restrictions at this point. But of course, China doesn't listen. It, it, China and Hong Kong weren't listening to what white people, a tiny minority of the world thinks. They were looking at uh, how their... Um, Hold on. Oh, that was weird. I uh, had a weird guest, like a spammy guest come up in the stream. It's very creepy. Um, so, yeah, COVID-19, right? White, white people have a big issue with restrictions, and they have had. And now, um, you know, that's how he a low-hanging fruit there. But this is where the meat comes in. Then there's the politics, the protests, the national security law, mass arrests, and relentless rhetoric have all had an impact. I have so many cherished memories of the city, but they mostly belong to an era that has ended. The city will, however, continue to occupy my thoughts. My elder son will stay and I will come back to visit. <laughs> so it's not really a departure. He's going to be visiting. I will continue to work for the South China Morning Post and hope the distance will give me fresh perspective than writing when writing this column. So, so yeah, it's always better to live far away to, to, to comment on things, right? Will the grass be greener in the UK? I've arrived at a perilous time. Britain has slid into crisis, the Times put it last week, along recession and rampant inflation loom. There will be no doubt frustrations and surprises ahead. But it's excited to walk the London streets where I began my career. The absence of COVID-19 restrictions make life in the UK feel like a different world. I feel naked without my mask, but it's a liberating experience. The flip side, of course, is that I'm almost certain to catch COVID-19. That's the price of living with the virus. Oh, so... So, uh, Mr. Uh, what's his name? Budler, Bidler. Uh, he's so sad about leaving Hong Kong. Now he's going to buttle. Now he's going to get COVID. Oh, so, so sad. So sad that he, he has no uh, co cojones, nothing to demand that his government do something about it, right? Crowds flock to bars and restaurants beside River Thames. There are even tourists. It's a reminder of the vibrancy and buzz Hong Kong has lost. It's literally city desperately needs to get back. So again, this is the colonial mindset. Hong Kong has to be like the United Kingdom. It has to be more like who used to own it, who used to colonize it. That's the colonizer mentality. Constantly thinking that you and your mother country, the motherland of imperialism and colonialism, uh, knows best. And that's what Hong Kong should be. So my initial excitement arriving in Hong Kong in UK will no doubt fade. When in the midst of a cold, dark British winter, I'm sure to long for sunny days in Hong Kong. The depressing battle of narratives that passes for debate these days is extended to the question of which is a better place to live. There's an easy answer. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses. It depends on what you're looking for. For me, after 20 years, it's time to return to the UK. But if I was 30 again, I would still take the chance to seek adventure in Hong Kong. Blah, blah, blah. I'm all of, uh, I love the low taxes, right? <laughs> he loves the low taxes, the enduring spirit of the people. I'm sure he liked the people a little too much. Uh, one of my last duties in Hong Kong was as MC to welcome new chief executive John Lee Kachu 
to the stage of the post-China conference last month. In an upbeat speech, he promised the city another leap forward. I hope he will make good on his promise to start a new chapter. Hong Kong needs to get over its obsession with COVID, reconnect with the world, and find a way to get back to the diverse, free, and open city we love. Farewell, Hong Kong. You are part of who I am. Thanks for making me feel welcome. I wish you all the best and look forward to this wonderful city enjoying happier times in the future. So weird because last time I checked, Mr. Buttle, uh, from a Hong Kong legislator, uh, Miss Nixie Lam, she just said that times are getting better, that there's more stability, there's less violence, less unrest. More, there aren't these protests with people carrying weapons, occupying polytechnic universities and train stations, terrorizing people, killing uh, uh, janitorial workers. That's not happening anymore. And the United States can't do whatever it wants in fueling this color revolutions. And the UK can't do whatever it wants to fuel this color revolution. So things have actually gotten better. And now you want to leave. That's kind of how I feel about the whole expat exodus. That's always how I always feel about those who are like, oh, man, I wish China, I wish anywhere where I used to be would be more like it was. Well, you want it to be more free and open for you. You don't want Hong Kong to actually tackle the problems it needs to tackle. Everything that Nixie Lam said about the uh, political situation right now seems much more favorable in actually addressing issues. Because also, as um, Kenny Coyle, my guest, uh, also from uh, from the UK, but he um, has lived in Hong Kong and traveled to Hong Kong a lot. He said that you know the colonial remnants in the government of Hong Kong are still very real, uh, and that, as Nixie Lam said, this has caused so many divisions, basically a paralysis on addressing issues that matter. And certainly, as you see with Hong Kong being such a widely liberalized, laissez-faire kind of economic capitalist system that worked out for financiers and that worked out for those who could plunder and kind of take advantage of Hong Kong, but it didn't really work out for people. And so it was ripe conditions to take advantage of a color of color revolution situation to, to spur a cover revolution. So Buttle, Mr. Buttle is crying all these white tears about Hong Kong and how he has to leave when actually things are a lot better. And look, if he wants to go see his family, just go see your family. You don't have to write an article about it. Leave. But he can probably return. He could probably return. It's just he doesn't want to live like Hong Kong and people in Hong Kong are trying to live, which is, in my opinion, a much more responsible uh, uh, approach to COVID-19. Changing policies right to take it to account that people do have needs it's not like people don't need to see their families be social that's a very important thing we don't get that we oftentimes if not always suffer right social uh, i mean sensory deprivation is a real problem just look at anyone who's in solitary confinement it's a big problem it can be torture so long term my more minor forms of sensory deprivation have long term effects and so Sure. If you want to talk about that, Mr. Buttle, go ahead. But you see how he made it political. He just threw in there, right? There's this unrest and the politics. And, oh, it's a, it's only after the national security law and the politics get more stable that you leave. And so for me, the expat exodus, what is it other than uh, uh, white Western foreigners feeling that China is no longer doing what they wanted China to do, which is one, to make them rich, and two, to move in the direction that they would hope they would move in, uh, a government and a system more like theirs, where they came from. And that's why, you know, I respect a lot of those who maybe have considered themselves expats or maybe those who have traveled and lived and done business and did other things in China who don't have that mentality who respect China's system. There are not that many, but there are a few. I, I know Nathan Rich. I know uh, Cyrus Jansen. I know Daniel Dumbra. I mean, these, these folks, they actually do respect China's system and the right of Chinese people to uh, dictate that system. And people like Buttle, though, uh, they hope right that they can just liberate themselves, throw off the mask and with no respect 
for how China is trying to do things, how Hong Kong is trying to do things. That's just entitlement. That's just this sort of uh, a Western and American exceptionalist mindset, this imperialist exceptionalism, this idea that your culture, your values, they should be dominant because your country, your system should dominate theirs, right? That's how it always works. It's not just this entitlement, feeling superiority morally, ethically, you know, ideologically. It always has to do with the end game being Hong Kong as a launching pad for a broader agenda, a broader agenda of bringing China to quote unquote heel, bringing China under the dominion of Western and U.S. capital. Never going to happen, not going to happen, but that's ultimately the aim. And that's why there's this expat exodus. Uh, honestly, there are both positives and negatives to this. Positives in the sense that uh, it does show that for those who can't handle self-determination, they leave. And, and negative in the sense that uh, they become kind of mouthpieces for the uh, right-wing opposition, neocon opposition uh, to uh, countries like China. So, all right, guys, last thing I want to show you before I head out. I, I wanted to cover this just because, I mean, this guy, Roger Waters, I've, I've always enjoyed it. He, he's a very uh, eccentric gentle, gentleman. I, I, I really enjoy watching him talk about politics. <laughs> he's definitely got that musician flair, that artist flair. And so he was on CNN recently talking about a whole host of things, including why Joe Biden is a war criminal. And I'm just taking this from Max Wubenthal's tweet. Uh, this video went viral. A lot of different people shared it. But um, Max Wubenthal tweeted it out. And I'm just going to show you what was said, okay? And let me know if you can hear me. Because this is a great clip. And I, and I definitely want to break it down. Because, I mean, he gained a lot of friends in China. Well, he's fueling uh, the he gained a lot of friends in China, I'll tell you that. I saw this uh, just going viral among uh, Chinese accounts. And uh, so anyway, let's let's uh, let's look into Roger Waters, what he had to say about why Joe Biden is a war criminal. Let me know if you can hear this as well. Well, he's fueling the fire in the Ukraine for a start. That is a huge crime. Why won't the United States of America uh, encourage Zelensky, the president, to negotiate obviating the need for this horrific, horrendous war but you're, that's you're, killing. You're blaming. How, we don't know how many you've But you're blaming the, the party Russians. that got invaded. Come on, you've got it reversed. Well, no, I, well that's, that you, you know, any war, when did it start? What you need to do is look at the history and you can say, well, it started on this day. You could say it started in 2008. Okay. It's basic. This war is basically about the. You can tell that the uh, I, I forget his name, the 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 interviewer here on CNN. You can tell that he was you can tell why he was silent about the 2008 reference, because that's a very that's an important date. That was the date that the United States floated. That's the date that NATO floated potential membership for Ukraine into nato so that just flew right over this guy's head this is cnn these corporate media outlets are not serious they don't have they don't know anything so that just <laughs> he's just like nodding along even though that's a pretty important point that you would think uh, a hack like this guy would want to interrupt but it's coming the action and reaction of nato pushing right up to the Russian border, which they promised they wouldn't do when Gorbachev negotiated the withdrawal of the USSR from the whole of Eastern Europe. When you say this, then... So you never hear that in Western media in the way that he is saying, in the way that Roger Waters is saying. it. You will hear references to this, but it's always under skepticism. Uh, was it a deal? Was it this? Was it... Was it actually that there was some kind of a deal made with uh, 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 with the Soviet Union over NATO expansion? Eh, it was a handshake. It wasn't really a written agreement. Roger Waters here is saying, no, th this NATO expansion goes against uh, what NATO had promised the Soviet Union. It's never talked about like that. 
it's always talked about as oh well it wasn't really maybe maybe not really so this you never hear it like this on on, on cnn and i have to say what about our role as liberators you of all people we you have no role as liberators world war ii talking? world war ii you, you, you got into this is why i wrote a book on american exceptionalism this is why i wrote a book on american exceptionalism our role as liberators what what in the i mean give me a uh, this is why we need a world war ii this is what all these so-called liberals these like this guy is obviously trying to cosplay like i'm a culture critic hippie whatever uh, this cnn corporate media hack has absolutely no idea how ridiculous he sounds world war ii uh, absolutely not world war ii uh, roger waters is going to explain why though you World lost War II because Come it's on. Pearl Harbor. You, Pearl Harbor. You were completely isolationist until that sad, that devastating. I, I would argue awful we were day always in, going to in get in. And that I would argue we were always going to go get into World War II because I just know all the history books in school taught me that the United States just held back for all kinds of benevolent reasons. You know, just to let the Soviet Union and 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 fascism. Uh, it, it let it let the let fascism beat down the Soviet Union and Europe enough, you know, because that's a noble cause. And oh yeah, we turned away the the migrating uh, Jews and and others, you know, those those persecuted by fascism because we just didn't want to admit them. And that was also very noble of us. I mean, this guy is completely a clown. I, I mean, absolutely a clown. Roger Waters literally tells him, "You were isolationist. They were the United States was the United States." wanted to remain neutral it did not want to enter the war because for a major reason roger waters isn't going to say this but the main reason the united states didn't want to enter world war ii is because it wanted what was going to happen next to occur it wanted to come out on top it wanted europe to be dependent on the united states and it wanted socialism to be weakened by fascism it wanted Nazism. It wanted the Japanese to do as much as they could to weaken communism, to weaken socialism. And that's why the United States was weak on both until the very end. And it absolutely did not play a decisive factor in World War II. The war was already determined uh, when the United States entered. It was already determined. It, it, certainly, the, the United States' entrance was an, a nothing burger. It certainly uh, sped things up. But it really tried to do that on its own terms. It was not benevolent. Pushed us in. But thank God the United States got in, right? God. You lost your father in World War II. Thank God well, the yeah, United thank States. Because, but right? thank God the how dare you? How, how dare you cite you lost your father in World War II? Thank God. What? <laughs> how is that going to even, even if we just divorce politics from that? You lost your father in World War II. You should be just absolutely thankful like no absolutely not uh if the united states the united states at that time had a military uh that it built up that could absolutely have been decisive very soon in that war and it decided not to do it decided not to you know the united states uh was one of the least scathed countries in world war one and one of the least uh damn it you know it, it one of the it, it it did not face the same impact as other countries in World War II, which means that it had the capacity and it just chose not to because imperialism doesn't enter wars on the accord of the interests of others. It enters wars, it, es it, it launches wars for its own interests. And that's what in both world wars, especially World War II, the United States was looking to hedge the whole time. That's why the United States also dropped nuclear weapons on Japan, not because it was decisive in defeating Japan. Japan was defeated. Japan was done. But the United States dropped a couple on Nagasaki and Hiroshima because the uh, Red Army was marching in that direction, and they wanted to show the Red Army, the Soviet Union, what the United States could do afterward. It was all about getting ready for what was to come, which was the negotiations of how the world would look 
now that Japan and Germany, the so-called Axis powers, the so-called fascist powers, uh, now that they were weakened and now that they were no longer going to have a leadership role in world affairs. The Russians had already won the bloody war almost by then. Don't forget, 23 million Russians died protecting you and me you from would, the Nazi you, menace. Hey, and you would think the Russians would have learned their lesson from war and what? <laughs> so this guy says, think about this. He says that you think the Russians would learn a lesson from war after losing 20 plus million people in World War II. He's referencing the special military operation. Let's just let's just look at this at face value. World War II, the Soviet Union was fighting fascism, was fighting Nazis was fighting the potential overthrow of uh, their political system and probably the entire political order in the rest of Europe as well. So the Soviet Union sacrificed everything to ensure the protection of their society and of their social system, as well as, as Roger Waters says, the rest of the world, because uh, without the Soviet Union, uh, fascism probably, uh, at least in the form of Nazi Germany, would still uh, be flourishing. So now we get to this Russia special military operation. This is so interesting. He's saying you would learn your lesson. Why, why would you do a special military operation after sacrificing all those people? Well, because they were fighting fascism. So if Russia has felt like it needed to fight fascism again, you wouldn't do it? Like this, this is this guy, the CNN hack, is basically saying that fighting fascism isn't worth it. You thought you'd learn your lesson then. Hey, actually, that just reinforces whatever people think about this narrative of uh, denazification. I actually believe that Russia has very has has absolutely every right to believe that the growth and influence of far right forces, including neo Nazism in Ukraine, is a fundamental threat to their interests. I absolutely believe that. I absolutely think that. That's my position. But this guy's making the point. But he's trying to do it in a way that discourages it. So he's, he's, in my opinion, he is making it so CNN looks like what they are, which is a mouthpiece and uh, a, a mouthpiece for empire and essentially cover for fascism. <laughs> Don't fight against fascism, guys. Learn your lesson wouldn't have invaded ukraine well you you Fair? with all your reading i would suggest you michael <laughs> that you go away and read a bit more and then try and figure out what the read a book united states would do if the chinese were putting um nuclear on missiles into mexico and canada the chinese are too busy encircling taiwan as we speak okay? they're not encircling taiwan taiwan <laughs> is part of china that face. I want to look at that face again. <laughs> Roger Waters. That's the face. Of <laughs> I mean, that should be a meme. That should be a meme because he's like, go read a book about Russia and Ukraine's history. Go read a damn book. This is absolutely ridiculous. And oh, yeah, guess what? Taiwan is part of China. I mean, that face. That that should be a meme that goes uh, all across the uh, uh, internet realm because absolutely that is correct. Taiwan is part of China, dude. Uh, this this is not that hard, but he's making it really hard. He's making it very hard. The CNN he's trying to he's making light of all of this, but really he's just getting uh, he's getting owned right here. He's getting absolutely taken down by by. Uh, 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 Roger Waters. And oh. that's been absolutely accepted by the whole of the international community since 1948. And if you don't know that, you're not reading enough. Go and read about it. Okay. Go and read a book to a CNN <laughs> to a CNN anchor. I mean, that, that was great. And that's absolutely how we need to be talking to these corporate media hacks should be reading a book, read about the Cairo declaration, which I believe he was citing, read about the one China policy, not that hard. There's three joint communiques. It's not light reading, but it's something 
uh, uh, that you can read and you can learn about. You can learn about these very important moments in U.S. China diplomatic uh, history. Not that hard. One China, you can read it. You can read. Go read UN Resolution Two Seven Five Eight. It's right there. The United Nations does not recognize any government in Taiwan as China. It recognizes Taiwan as part of China and uh, the People's Republic of China as the rightful government of all of China. So that's the law. But yet people like this CNN hack have the gall to go to Roger Waters and say, your dad died in World War II. Aren't you gl- what? Aren't you glad America entered the war and then doesn't even know what the one China policy is, they, but has the has the absolute audacity to say, ah, oh, the uh, China is is um, China's encircling Taiwan, right? Encircling Taiwan, which is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. There's no basis in fact there. And, and just look at this map. I, I posted this on Twitter yesterday. Uh, next time someone says China is militarily encircling Taiwan, show them this. These are the bases. This is from Base Nation, which came out with a report talking about all of the bases that surround China. Look at that. A noose around China's neck or an attempted noose around China's neck. Look at there's Taiwan. If anybody knows their geography. So, I mean, it's a joke. As Nixie Lamb said. It's a joke. It's a joke because it's there's no fact base behind any of this. But, you know, Roger Waters did a really good thing here. He made a lot of fans in China because he upheld, what, 90-plus percent of all Chinese people support, which is the one China policy. And he went after this guy. He, he, he really, he really um, corrected this guy on both Russia and Russia and China and the history that this guy just didn't understand, doesn't understand uh, how, why Russia may want to do something about NATO expansion. Doesn't understand why China is angry about Taiwan and the way that the United States has treated that situation. How can you be a journalist? How can you even ask pol- pol- questions about politics? Why not just go cosplay your culture critic nonsense? You're talking to Roger Waters. You have absolutely, if you have nothing to say about Joe Biden's war criminality, then why ask about it, right? Oh, well, you're asking about it because you carry water for Biden and the Democrats and the corporate uh, media and the establishment. Oh, okay. You know, that's, that's what the media is all about, carrying water. I mean, that guy, he might as well just be a, a, a press secretary for Joe Biden, right? This is, that's what they all are. They're all glorified press secretaries. Get, then get them out there. Uh, like the uh, all of his press secretaries have been horrible. Uh, Trump's were not much better either. But you know, you 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 just bring push them out there as press secretaries. See how they do. Uh, they all sound like bumbling idiots. Um, but it's not that much of a far cry from their very scripted nonsense they do in the corporate media. So anyway. I just wanted to comment on that because Roger Waters. I mean. Uh, uh, I appreciate his, he really is staunchly anti-war and anti-imperialist. And, you know, the context for this is that he's doing this whole concert tour, uh, really raising the issue of Julian Assange. And so, you know, there aren't many entertainers of his caliber who are willing to speak out on these things. And so, you know, I thought I would play that because it's really important. It's really important. Go read a book. I mean, what kind of, that, that advice right? It's really applicable to so many people at this point. But that advice is really good advice. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's really easy to dunk on. It's just so easy. It's low hanging fruit at this point. Uh, The corporate media might as well not engage with people like Roger Waters because it's just an embarrassment. It's just a a real embarrassment. So anyway, guys, I'm going to actually end today. It's 11 o'clock p.m. sharp. A couple days away from streaming, there'll be clips up on the channel uh, probably over the next few days. I'm going to try to get those out to you. Um, I got to do a call-in show, but it's not going to happen today. Uh, I will do one, and I'll make sure to announce that as well. I'm going to try to do one probably later in the week, do a couple. I got to make them up. Um, 
and then I'll be back streaming. I'm going to be on Revolutionary Left Radio tomorrow. It'll be fun uh, connecting with Brett again. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've got to do some other things. Got to get back on with Margaret. Got to cover Camp Dada with the uh, uh, Sabby and folks. So I got a few things to come. Um, got to write a little bit. So there's a lot coming up. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Nixie Lamb. She's great. I love, you know, there are quite a few people like Nixie Lamb out there, guys. I, all the time, you know, we think that because if you read and follow Chinese media, right, there's a real diplomatic tone to it. There's a real uh, kind of careful analysis that's done. And rightfully so, especially when you're representing the whole of China's international media. But uh, there's quite, I mean, this is, uh, I when I hear Nixie Lamb talk, even though I, I, I really enjoy it, I love the criticality. I love the the strength and the power of the words. It's something I kind of expect at this point. This is the this is the situation we're in. People are angry, and uh, uh, China and the Chinese people have every right to be angry with the United States and how they they are being treated by the United States. Blatant disrespect, blatant imperialism, blatant hegemonic threats, just blatant empire trying to knock on China's door and. Uh, every right to be angry about that and so you know i thought the conversation was incredible and and really good and so i hope you continue to share it uh while you're coming out of this like the video of course and uh as you know you know i'm about 10 i believe i'm only 10 away actually 10 subscribers on patreon for 500 that's my goal for this month and um oh man Oh, nine away now. I'm only nine subscribers away on Patreon. Uh, so nine away. So subscribe there. And damn, I forgot to get to the Patreon patron question. I knew I forgot something. But I will get to uh, the question. There's one last question for this week. I'm going to get to that on the next stream. Because um, I'm doing now. Uh, subscribers on Patreon can uh, submit their questions. And um, I will answer them on the streams. I'll try to do at least one. I talk a lot. So, you know, it'll probably be one per stream. Uh, but I'm sure eventually I can get to everybody's. Uh, it was actually a good, um, a good question. But uh, I will get to that next time. All right. So thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I will see you again very soon. Like the video on the way out. Share the playback. And uh, hopefully I'll see you on Patreon, patreon.com slash Danny Haifang. Salute.